My name is James Robson, and I'm the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard Asia Center. I'd like to welcome you to the Asia Center's Research Talk Series, which is part of a new series of virtual programming at the Asia Center. The research talks are aimed at showcasing some of the fascinating research that's being done on various facets of Asia by Harvard students, graduate students, faculty, Asia Center affiliates, and other specialists. We very much hope you enjoyed learning from these talks. Did you know that Black revolutionaries in the 1970s used acupuncture? The stories before us are unexpected and little-known stories of American history and acupuncture. And in many ways, Unexpected Connections is the story of acupuncture. The conventional history of acupuncture in the United States starts in July 1971 with New York Times reporter James Rustin's trip to China, where he wrote about his experience with acupuncture. He was part of a team to prepare for President Richard Nixon's trip to China in 1972. Rustin fell ill with appendicitis and underwent surgery, and his post-operative pain was managed by an acupuncturist. His article would cause a frenzy of interest in acupuncture in the United States. But the stories before us have nothing to do with Rustin, and they actually begin in parallel. We have Dr. Tolbert Small in Oakland, California, and Dr. Mutulu Shakur at the Lincoln Detox Center in New York City. And what makes these stories even more surprising is the fact that Dr. Small and Shakur didn't know each other in the 70s. And yet there is a fundamental similarity. Against the backdrop of medical discrimination, these stories are about people fighting against a healthcare system that didn't serve them by using what I'm calling toolkit care, a self-assembled, essential mobile community care in response to dire situations. It's similar to first aid, but it has more of a do-it-yourself spirit, and what's included in the toolkit is decided upon by the people themselves. In this case, Dr. Small and Shakur sought out a variety of resources and included, of all things, acupuncture into their toolkit. Hello? Hi. Hi, Dr. Small. This is the first time I talked to Dr. Small, and I spoke to him about his interest in acupuncture. You learned about acupuncture on your trip to China, right, in 1972? Yeah, we were actually in Shanghai. Dr. Wu uh, was, a, was an acupuncturist, gave us a couple of lectures on acupuncture. When I came back, uh, I basically did all the acupuncture points on myself. It was actually illegal in state California. So I used to, you have to have, I used to have a card that said, Talbot Small Research Acupuncturist. And I used to do house calls all over West Oakland and North Oakland. Uh -huh. acupuncture on people. Uh, Dr. Small has been in Oakland for the past half century serving his community as a physician and acupuncturist, where he's affectionately known as the People's Doctor. He graduated from the Wayne State Medical School in Detroit in 1968 before he left for Oakland for residency. In 1970, Dr. Small became a physician for the Black Panther Party, a civil rights group centered on self-defense. And he treated members such as Bobby Seale or affiliates such as Angela Davis. However, Dr. Small never became a formal member of the party because he disagreed with some of their stances and believed that he can best help by focusing on medicine. He directed the George Jackson Medical Clinic, one of the Panther Party's many medical clinics that offered free health care. And he also co-directed the National Sickle Cell Anemia Project that educated and screened for the disease in Black communities around the country. In November 1971, Panther leader Huey Newton traveled to China, and on that trip, he asked Premier Zhou Enlai if he can organize a following trip for community members. For some context, the Panther Party was hugely inspired by Mao Zedong and sold many copies of the Little Red Book, a collection of Mao's writings to earn revenue. Mao had also declared his support of the Black community in America in 1963. However, his intentions have been debated. Did he support the cause, or was he simply trying to undermine American power? Either way, Newton was given the green light to organize a group of 20 people. Dr. Small was on this trip in March 1972, and the composition of the group was fascinating. So half of them were not quote-unquote special and not members of the Panther Party, and included nurses, lawyers, and chaplains. Dr. Small was considered to be part of this group, and he was the only doctor. The other half of the group were formal Panther Party members. When did you get to China? Oh, I can tell you exactly. March the 7th, Tokyo Hilton, landed in Vancouver, beat by the hospital signs. Welcome, Hewitt Travel Group. We were also agreed by Peter's plot to split up the contract to support the leadership and all the subversive. Based on the wall, you have no, no, no rights in Canada. All Black Panthers would be deported as subversive. <laughs> the anti-subversive law has only been enforced against Panthers. That was Dr. Small reading from his journal on the first day of travel. American officials made it difficult for them and they had to detour many times before they got to China. 
Over the course of the seven weeks, they traveled all over, visiting cultural sites and factories, learning about the revolutionary processes happening in China. They also witnessed acupuncture anesthesia and visited rural health clinics where they watched barefoot doctors in action. So barefoot doctors were lay people trained to provide basic Western and Chinese medicine to rural areas, and it was a large national movement led by the Maoist government. There were over 1 million barefoot doctors, each of whom carried their own medical toolkits as they treated underserved communities. This was the inspiration for the delegate's toolkit care. David Levinson, on the left, was 19 years old when he went on this trip, and he was one of the few formal white members of the party. Here, he tells me how the barefoot doctors inspired the delegation. Yeah, we were coming from a very, very um, enthusiastic, young, revolutionary right. idea ourselves, and going to what we felt was a very enthusiastic, young, uh, mass grand scale. And one of the things they were doing was this incredible revolution in healthcare, or so it seemed, in developing a healthcare system which was committed to providing for poor people and therefore the whole doctor idea. A lot of it involves acupuncture. In fact, some of us started buying some Chinese acupuncture needles, started messing around with each other, not knowing what we were doing. And the Chinese saw us doing that. So they actually provided us with some formal teaching. Upon returning home, Dr. Small taught himself acupuncture. And here are some of the patients he's treated. In 1974, he published two papers on acupuncture, doing a literature review on acupuncture anesthesia and looking at the neurophysiological basis for acupuncture. In 1980, he opened up a private practice, the Harriet Tubman Medical Clinic, which was in operation for over 30 years until 2016. Today, he works for other healthcare centers. Inspired by the barefoot doctors, and ever since he's picked up acupuncture in 1972, Dr. Small has integrated it with Western medicine in his metaphorical and literal toolkit he brings with him as he cares for and serves his community. Phantom horse winging its path through the sky, showering light upon the east, though masked by the west, by cultural clouds of doubt. Yes, Westerners, Cut away your cultural shards. Investigate the new changes that don't ignore it. Our second story is on the East Coast with Dr. Mutulu Shakur. Dr. Shakur was a formal member of the Republic of New Africa, a black nationalist organization, and he was an affiliate of the Panther Party. He was also the stepfather of rapper Tupac Shakur. So this is the Lincoln Detox poster from 1975. Let's break it down. Here, it says the Lincoln Detox People's Program, which referred to the detox clinic at the Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx. The 1970s South Bronx was battling with an intense heroin epidemic, and the Lincoln Hospital was a site of medical discrimination, with many patients dying due to negligence. The Panther Party and the Young Lords, another revolutionary group, decided to take over the hospital in November 1970 and reform it. Next, we have these skulls which represented the oppressive forces in the community, like Eli Lilly, a pharmaceutical company, the USA FBI, as well as the CIA. If you look at the bill of the hats from left to right, it says methadone kills, drugs kill, heroin kills. One of the main goals of the detox center was to educate its community on heroin and methadone addiction. They believed that their community was under a chemical warfare attack and supposedly helpful interventions such as methadone maintenance were only binding them to another harmful substance. At the bottom, it says we will fight heroin and methadone addiction by any means necessary, and the main means by which they did so, and the most effective intervention they kept in their toolkit, was acupuncture. Dr. Shakur first heard about acupuncture through his friend and fellow activist Yuri Kochiyama in 1970, and he read about ear acupuncture for withdrawal symptoms in articles about a Bangkok doctor and a Hong Kong doctor named H.L. Wen. This is what Dr. Shakur has to say about the early days. Oh, from 71 to 72, approximately, before we even got needles, we would, people would come up to the Bronx, dope fiends, hardened dope victims, who would massage their ears and massage their hands and their legs, and we would stand there with our fingers in their ears or in the different points, and we do deep breathing, and they'd fall right out to sleep, and just relax, next day we'd be back for that treatment. And we would detoxify people off of heroin and cocaine and methadone with acupressure, a lot of love, a lot of commitment to it. And it was some of the most rewarding times of our lives, you know. And it was it was just great. It was just great. It was spirited. And we then began to get the needles and learn needle insertions and how to deal with various symptoms. 
The Lincoln Detox team eventually went up to the Montreal Institute of Traditional Chinese Medicine, and Dr. Shakur received an acupuncture doctorate degree here in 1976. Here is a page from the newspaper of the White Lightning, a group of white revolutionaries in the South Bronx. Here we see a discussion of how acupuncture could eliminate the use of methadone, and a patient named Delphina speaks about how her acupuncture treatment was so good that she didn't need her methadone. Delphina was one of thousands of patients that visited the Lincoln Detox program. The team, however, not only treated people, but also trained anyone who was interested in learning acupuncture and incorporating it in their own toolkits. And the Lincoln Collective paired this training with political education and developed what they called a barefoot doctor cadre. The Lincoln Detox became not only recognized by the community as a political formation, but its work in developing and, and saving men and women of the third world inside of the oppressed communities resuscitating these brothers and sisters and putting them into some form of healing process within the community, we became a threat to the city of New York and consequently with the development of the Barefoot Doctor Acupuncture Cadre, we began to move around the country and educate various other community orientations around acupuncture, drug withdrawal, and the strategy of methadone and teaching the brothers and sisters the fundamentals of acupuncture, the theory of acupuncture, how it was used in the revolutionary context in China and in Vietnam, and how we were able to use it in the South Bronx and our success. Lincoln Detox certainly faced its challenges. Dr. Richard Taft, shown here, a Western physician who used his credentials to support the center, was found dead in October 1974, and his death was declared a heroin overdose, though he had no record of using drugs. It is strongly believed that he was murdered to discredit the program. The program continued to face resistance, and on November 1978, the center was closed by a task force of 200 police officers, and the state claimed that the program was badly mismanaged, committing fraud, and using highly questionable treatment methods that included the radical indoctrination of patients. More than 70 supporters protested the closure of the clinic that day, believing that it was being framed. Dr. Shakur was forced to leave, but he went on to create the Harlem Institute of Acupuncture and the Black Acupuncture Advisory Association of North America in 1978. These organizations trained roughly 100 people in acupuncture, many of whom were also political activists. However, in 1982, Dr. Shakur went underground. He was federally indicted under the racketeer-influenced and corrupt organization laws, which alleged that the team acted as a criminal enterprise that robbed armored trucks for funding. One of the incidences was the 1981 Brinks robbery. The allegations against Dr. Shakur are complicated and have been linked to the FBI's counterintelligence program, otherwise known as COINTELPRO. Dr. Shakur was arrested on February 12, 1986, and has been jailed ever since. Though mandatory parole regulations meant he was supposed to be released in 2016, he has repeatedly been denied parole, and he was recently diagnosed with cancer in 2019. A few of the original Lincoln team members relocated the program, but now the clinic focused solely on acupuncture treatment and training. In 1985, then-director Michael Smith formalized the National Auricular Detoxification Association, or also known as NADA. A particular five-point area acupuncture protocol, known as the NADA protocol, was also formalized, and it is used for drug detoxification, general anxiety, pain, and stress relief. This treatment has expanded worldwide with estimates of over 25,000 practitioners. These photos are from Sue Cox, an acupuncturist who spent time at Lincoln in the early 90s and has worked to bring acupuncture to 128 of the 150 prisons in the United Kingdom. I will cover these stories in my next video and explore specifically what makes ear acupuncture so suitable for these practitioners and their toolkit. I began this video with a question mark, and it represents the unexpected connection between Black revolutionaries and acupuncture. Yeah, I hope this brief overview has shown how these stories make sense. In a fraught social, political, and medical context, it makes sense that people would seek alternative measures. This gives us a nuanced definition of integrative medicine. Integrative medicine is not just about the integration of different medical practices, but also about the integration of medical with social practices. For Dr. Small and Shakur, that social practice was serving the people body and soul. Their use of acupuncture had socio-political meanings to it. Acupuncture fit their local medical and social needs and was part of this DIY, metaphorical, and literal toolkit which they used to serve their community. But their local needs were not necessarily the same. Though I put these stories under the same title, they are in fact different. Oakland and South Bronx were different. Dr. Small and Dr. Shakur were different. Though both were associated with the Panther Party, Dr. Small never formally joined the party and Dr. Shakur was instead a formal member of the Republic of New Africa. 
Their toolkits were different. Dr. Small was first a Western doctor who was inspired to use acupuncture. Dr. Shakur received support from Western doctors, but he himself practiced Chinese medicine, and its difference from biomedicine was politically important. He used acupuncture in a much more explicitly political way, and he combined it with political education. Both were, of course, influenced by the Barefoot Doctors movement, but the legacies of Mao on their lives are not so straightforward. These differences and nuances matter because they prevent us from painting entire groups of people as the same. But of course, there are fundamental connections. These stories ask us who has the right to heal, what is medicine, and for whom does it serve? And they tell us that healing comes in all forms and is meant to serve all patients. And so to the question that always gets asked, does acupuncture work? Well, I think we can ask the thousands and thousands of people that Dr. Small and Shakur have helped and continue to help. To the healers and their patients who have the right to be healed. We are healers. We toiled for years to learn the mystery of the human body. We nourish spirits from birth to the grave. We mend the bones. We sew the cuts. We kill the pain. We cool the fevers. We soothe the spirits. We are healers. We bring new life. We close old life. We pick the herbs. We needle away the pain. We cut out the cancer. We poison the germs. We calm the troubled mind. We are healers. We treat the whole body as one universe. We also treat each part of the universe. We keep the hearts pumping. We keep the lungs breathing. We know as long as life exists, we will be healers. We know that our patients will always have the right to be healed.